We were told the only way to prevent another terrorist attack on U.S. soil was to invade and occupy Afghanistan. Conveniently located in an extremely profitable region, once out of reach to U.S. business, like the natural gas-rich former Soviet republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan, and at a crossroads for trade for U.S. business competitors, Russia, China, and India. They trumpeted the heroism of saving Afghanistan from a dark, feudal past, a new future where women could be free and democracy could replace extremism. Vampire's leaders often don't expect us to take a simple look at history. There was one time in Afghanistan's past where women's rights were advancing and codified into law, where literacy programs for girls and impoverished people were on the rise. This Afghanistan was one the empire paid billions of dollars to destroy. In the 70s, the social progress coming from Kabul angered Afghanistan's feudal lords and ultra-conservative religious groups. Forming the Mujahideen, they attacked women's schools and carried out a reign of terror. But the empire felt it had more in common with the Mujahideen than the new government and started pumping millions of dollars in cash, advanced weapons and training into these groups, sponsoring the ongoing atrocities. Excited that the Soviet Union sent its military to support the government, the CIA dumped even more money to fund the Mujahideen. The group even received a grand welcome at the White House. Journalist and author Ahmed Rashid writes about the effect of this U.S. operation. Some 35,000 Muslim radicals from 40 Islamic countries joined Afghanistan's fight between 1982 and 1992. Afghan people don't have a history of being religious zealots. To create the CIA, desired jihad required the recruitment of Arab, Egyptian, and Pakistani extremists. So the fundamentalism that emerged in Afghanistan is a CIA construct. So what groups had their formative years here on the U.S. taxpayer's dime? Oh, just Osama bin Laden and his network, and the people who became the Taliban, eventually seizing power in 1996. The Clinton administration engaged with and cooperated with the Taliban almost immediately afterward to ensure oil giant Unical's proposed pipelines flowed freely. But with a new opportunity to plant bases in one of the most resource-rich regions of the world, an invasion was launched. The stated goal wasn't ever to capture bin Laden, but rather to destroy al-Qaeda and Taliban training camps in the country. We haven't uh, captured any al-Qaeda, but... And, and how many have you actually managed to kill here in southeast Afghanistan? We haven't killed any. At the outset, the Pentagon's generals were brimming with arrogance about their easy conquest. But occupying a country where 92% have never even heard of what, quote, foreigners call 9-11 didn't prove so simple. And as contempt and resistance to the occupation spread, the war became a military disaster. Casualties for U.S. service members surged. From 2009 to 2010, U.S. troops requiring limb amputations increased 60%, with a 90% increase in severe wounds to their genitalia. So generals and politicians did the only thing they know how to do, lie about the reality and order more slaughter. Heard from their own mouths. Commander of British forces from 2007 to 2008 said the Afghanistan war is neither feasible nor supportable. The American strategy is doomed to fail. Atreus, commander of US forces in Afghanistan from 2010 to 2011 said, you have to recognize that I don't think you win this war. This is the kind of fight we're in for the rest of our lives, and probably our kids' lives. And Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, who interviewed hundreds of soldiers touring Afghanistan on two separate tours, said, when you're given a mission that cannot succeed, what is the purpose of the mission? How many more men must die behind an array of optimistic statements by U.S. senior leaders in Afghanistan? Like with Vietnam, when the commanders knew they couldn't win, they wanted to make sure to preserve the face of this invincible empire by retreating in slow motion, leaving a trail of bombs and limbs behind them. In 2012, Staff Sergeant Matthew Sitton 
on his third tour to Afghanistan, wrote to his congressman, I'm only writing this email because I feel myself and my soldiers are being put into unnecessary positions where harm and danger are imminent. There is no end state or purpose for the patrols given to us from our higher chain of command, only that we will be out for a certain period of time. As a brigade, we are averaging at a minimum an amputee a day from our soldiers because we're walking around aimlessly through grape rows and compounds that are littered with explosives. I'm concerned about the well-being of my soldiers, and I've tried to voice my opinion through the proper channels of my own chain of command, only to be turned away and told that I need to stop complaining. Thank you again for allowing soldiers to voice their opinion. If anything, please pray for us. God bless. Very respectfully, SSG Matthew Sitton. He was killed just weeks later, leaving behind a wife and newborn child. To date, 2,355 soldiers have died. An estimated 20,000 have been maimed. What utter contempt for the lives of service members from the people who say most avidly that they support the troops. Now that the end of this slow retreat has come, paved with the lives of at least 26,000 Afghans, the U.S. plans to maintain massive bases there, occupied by 10,000 troops until at least 2024. Afghanistan's new government is far from the bright and democratic future the U.S. promised, but a wildly corrupt one run by warlords, passing laws as repressive as the Taliban. A staggering 90% of the world's opium now comes from Afghanistan, after being nearly eradicated pre-2001. Planning to never leave, officials can only hope that the public doesn't notice the war still churns on, pointlessly throwing more lives away. Now the country's longest war, costing taxpayers a shocking $2 billion a week, Afghanistan was just a stepping stone in the post-9-11 offensive. By 